Well, it's finally warm enough uh, to be working outside and it's not raining for once, which is nice because all next week it's supposed to rain. So I am making hay literally while the sun shines. Uh, the camera is riding in a wagon full of hay, or I guess not technically hay. I'm taking a little liberties there. It's grass clippings, uh, or more than clippings. It's long bits of glass, grass that I cut with the scythe in the front yard. And now I'm taking them back to the compost. You're riding along, so welcome to Food Mageddon. I am working to get as much done as I can before it starts raining, at least outside, and once it rains I'll be working just primarily in the greenhouse. But here we have what will break down to be probably less than one wheelbarrow full of compost. And I need about two dozen wheelbarrows full of compost each year, so even though it looks like a lot right now, this breaks down into a disappointingly small amount. So this week on Food Mageddon, you'll see me mowing the lawn, planting out corn, making beds, weeding, and generally just being as busy as I possibly can be uh, until it starts raining again. So that's gonna be the name of the game, I think, for the next month. I have to do a little maintenance on my scythe and it's something called peening, P-E-E-N. You've probably heard of a ball peen hammer. That's what you do with a ball peen hammer, you peen things. It just basically means hitting cold metal, hammering cold metal to change the shape. And this blade is really thin. And when I hit something that's a uh, woody stem or something that's a little bit tougher than it should, um, it can bend and deform, just in normal wear and tear it can crack and get micro fissures along the cutting surface and gets out of alignment, yada yada yada. So, once every, oh, once every eight or so hours of use, I will peen it and I will beat that sharp edge back into shape. So here, for example, you can see how the edge is kind of beaten up. It's got nicks and it's uneven. So I am going to try and fix that. And all I'm using here is a narrow anvil and a broad hammer. I could use this narrow side and a broad anvil. But that takes more skill. This is a lot easier. Now this doesn't actually make it too much sharper. For that, I have to use my, my stone here. It's got rough sides and then smoother sides. Hey. Whoa, well I got a lot sharper. So this is a, this is a 55 centimeter Falchi blade from uh, Italy, and it's very different than an American style scythe. So this is more of an American style scythe, and you can see how the blade and how it connects to the wood are straight. Um, this is different than my Italian scythe, which I'll show you in a minute. And basically the bend comes from the wood. And so when you're cutting, the blade lies flat on the ground, but it's be the wood has to bend for that to happen, right? Um, this blade is also a lot heavier. This whole thing actually weighs probably twice as much as what I use. And so, you can see the blade sits flat on the ground, but the handle's straight, 
Whereas to make this blade sit flat on the ground, the handle has to bend. Um, this would also, like I said, weighs significantly less, which for my money is nice because if you're doing this all day, then having a light scythe is, is much nicer. All this scythe material, at least my, my modern stuff from One Scythe Revolution, I'll link to their website right now, uh, but look up onesitherevolution.com. They have all kinds of videos and basically any scythe or scything accessory you could, uh, you could hope to have. Um, Botan Anderson, the guy who runs that, also gets workshops and things about teaching people how to use a scythe properly, and that's where I learned. I'm not an expert on using a scythe, but I do like that it's quiet, it doesn't require a lot of gas, nothing like that. It's relaxing, quiet, I, again, just uh, it's a more enjoyable way for me to mow the lawn. I try and keep what I have to mow to a minimum, and we're going to reuse this as you'll see in a little bit. I mean, I can have the little guy on my back and do this, and it's, it's not that hard, and it's friendly to the environment. It's just great. I enjoy it. Now, I'm not an expert on this or anything else, but most people think the scythe goes like this, and you cut things by going across the blade, but that's not really how it goes. Really what it is, it's going along the blade. So this, I, you know, it does cut things, but it's just not the right way to do it. It's just, it's not an efficient way to do it. It doesn't move things, and it, uh, the blade isn't designed to do that. It's a thin blade. So what you want to do is slide and barely you move it forward only a couple inches each time but it slices the front picks up the vegetation then it gets sliced on the beard or the back so this line is called a windrow and it makes it really easy to compost and pick up all this vegetation So a couple of weeks ago, I built this compost hutch, and I have a pallet up here on top, uh, but I'm gonna put some shingles on it. And these shingles are recycled cedar shingles that I tore off the house. They're kind of rotted. I don't really care. It's not a big deal if water gets through, if there's some drips. I just don't want my compost pile to be constantly rained on. Uh, so, you know, these will eventually just go right into the compost, which is nice. Um, and for those of you that know how to install cedar shingles, this is not the correct way. I'm not overlapping them properly, I'm not spacing them properly, I'm not even going to line them up properly because it's a compost hutch, I don't care. You want to learn how to install uh, cedar shingles? Go to the Cedar Shingle Bureau of America's uh, website and they have a manual. For those of you out there that are watching, for uh, tens of viewers, uh, you know, one of you knows how to do single cedar, cedar shingles. Yeah, I know I'm doing it wrong, I don't care. And now I just have to add some shingles to the front. And now through the magic of editing, it's done. So now what I'm gonna do is just add a lot of my carbon here, the freshly cut grass, into my hutch and to balance it out, I went ahead and got chicken droppings. So I'm just gonna do couple shovelfuls of ammonia holding chicken poo and then a whole bunch more grass and vegetation and ah, to get this to heat up I need to give it enough oxygen so I got to be out here every couple of days pulling all this out that's why I leave the front off I don't have a front to my compost bins I can just pull it right out and then do this again, uh, where I lift and separate. Toss it in. Ooh. Last time I did this, it was already warm. Oh yeah, it's pretty hot. Uh, 
I would say easily 100 degrees, but I want to get it up to 160. I really want to get this cooking and burning up the seeds and the bad microbes in here. I want to get it as hot as I possibly can. This might be something I do in the winter in the greenhouse to add a little extra heat. It's an idea I'm toying with. I try and make everything go in a circle. So my lawn clippings become compost, my chicken poo becomes compost. That all helps me grow more food for the chickens and ourselves. Which is just one big cycle. A couple weeks ago on the blog, I published an excerpt from one of my favorite series. That's the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett. And in it, they have a compost pile that becomes alive and tries to eat people. And I published that under the headline of compost goals. You can find that at lowtechinstitute.org and have a read of that yourself. Looks like it's overflowing now, but give it two, three weeks, it'll have settled down to half this size. In three months, it'll be a quarter. And by one year from now, I'll be lucky if it's a whole wheelbarrow full. So this summer I was hoping to do a, a study, but we didn't get funding and then this whole crisis happened anyway, so that's fine. Basically, what I wanted to look at was something called polycropping. And polycropping is the opposite of monocropping. Monocropping is when you plant an entire field full of corn, beans, squash, whatever. In many native and even permaculture and, and modern planting ideas, uh, it's thought that some plants are complementary. And when you plant them together, they help one another. And the oldest polycrop that we know of, more or less, is corn, beans, and squash, the so-called three sisters that were really common across North America uh, before contact. And corn, beans, and squash were grown in such a way that the corn would grow up making a trellis for the beans to crawl up them, and the squash would spread out and suppress weeds. And the beans would provide nitrogen to the soil. So they were a symbiotic system helping one another. Now, my study wants to look at how that affects yield. And so what I've done is I've split these two equally sized areas. This one's a trapezoid, this one's a triangle, but they're the same area. And what I'm doing is I'm planting corn, beans, and squash alone on this side. And then I'm planting the same amount of corn, beans, and squash together on this side. They'll both get the same amount of compost. They'll same, get the same amount of growing area. They'll get the same everything except these will be grown together as a polycrop. These will be grown independently as three separate monocrops. At the end of the season, I should be able to count up and weigh the different amounts of food grown on each of them to see if there's an actual uh, difference between what's grown in polycrop over here and what's grown in monocrop over here. Uh, so what I've done is I have hoed up 12 inch mounds every three feet for corn here. They each have received five kernels of corn and two quarts of compost. And that will get dumped in here. And then I will thin them down to three corn plants per mound. On this side, I've grown, I have uh, 18 inch mounds at four foot spacing. They get a gallon of compost and they're gonna get both corns and beans at the same amount that we do over here, but these are gonna be separate and these are gonna be combined. So today I am busy uh, hoeing up these mounds. It's a lot more work than smother planting, which is what I prefer, but in terms of doing this study, this is probably the best way to do it. cornfield is planted, both the polycrop and the monocrop. The oats are beginning to come up, as are the weeds, but there are oats. The turnips are sprouting nicely. I need to weed between the rows. 
the beans have been a little slow to germinate. And something got in and started eating my delicious peas. So I had to find the short in the fence and fix it. And now I have to reweed and trellis all the peas. Once a day, I pull the plastic cover off of this box of straw with mycelium, which you can see growing through in the white, and I give it a spritz of water. And hopefully before long, we'll see pinning, which is basically little incipient mushrooms growing right out of the mycelium. We don't have anything yet, but once that starts happening, it'll fruit for a couple of weeks. And then I'll be able to flush it again, and it'll fruit for another couple weeks, and maybe even a third time. So we'll see how many pounds of oyster mushrooms we get out of this cube of straw, which then gets composted. Full circle. All right, now we got lettuce. Now you might be thinking, hey, this looks like a lot more work to plant lettuce than I do. I just till my garden and then plant lettuce seeds and then I just thin them to the distance and space I want. You seem like you have to do a couple extra steps here and that's absolutely true. This is more work. Um, there is an inverse proportion between efficiency and production. The, the more time you put in, the more product you can get out of it, often up to a point. Obviously there's diminishing returns at some point. But, you know, these nine plants came from nine seeds. I'm thinning them out now, right? So I get more plants per seed packet, uh, but I spend more time, so it's a trade-off. Uh, seed packets are, or were, cheap. I'll probably have way more seeds than I need next year, and maybe I won't do this, but... It's just a different way to do it. It's less energetically efficient. I have to do more work, but I get pretty good results, at least so far. We'll see how that goes throughout the season. You'll get to see that as we go along. Now time for more peas. So next to my fava beans, I'm going to grow cucumbers, so they'll grow up and over um, as the fava beans peter out, so uh, cucumbers will take over after the fava beans are done. Okay, so essentially, remember I have cardboard smothering all the weeds, and so I could either put a lot of compost on top of this, which I don't have, or I can poke through a small spot. so that the roots of the cucumber plant can dig down into my nice soil and I can use that existing fertility. I can plop down some growing mix there and then in each hole I'll put two seeds and then I will thin it to one. If both emerge I'll pick the best looking one and snip the other. And so then I'll do this for all of them and then I'll give them a bit of a, a drink. And uh, hopefully then we'll have this trellis full of cucumbers in not too long. And now I get to make similar planting of beets. each one foot hole, I put three beets, so they'll grow in a clump. So in this bed I'm going to take advantage of having lots of mustard seeds, and I'm just going to disturb all of the, all of the weeds that are growing here already so that they die, and I'm just going to top seed it with a whole bunch of mustard seeds and just rake them in not even in rows, not even anything like that. 
and just let hundreds of them come up and we'll eat lots of baby mustard and I'll pick those out between what are gonna be rows and I'll leave the, the rows to grow bigger. When I do plant peas, I do plant them directly this way. I hoe a six inch wide trench and then I drop them in. And these are Langston's Progress number nine shell peas. Um, I probably have enough for two more rows and that'll be the last of my peas for the spring. Hopefully it doesn't get too hot too quickly and these have time to bear fruit. Well, not quite fruit, but you know what I mean. to transplant because it's so dark and gray out the nice thing is it's not going to stress the plants out and they'll have a day to establish themselves before they really get hit with sun I'm gonna put these tomatoes as deep as I can because their stems will send out roots so right now this one's roots are only that long but if I bury it up to there it doubles the effective root depth. These are German Johnson tomatoes. It's a beefsteak style tomato. So I'm planting them by the house because these will be something we'll be slicing and eating on a more regular basis than say the paste tomatoes which will wait until they're fully ripe and a whole bunch of them all at once to harvest. Now tomato cages are not really my favorite way to keep tomatoes. And I'll show you my other trellises when I get those going. But I had them and they're here. So I'll use them. Well there we have another week in the books and uh, Boy, uh, I got tired just watching all those videos again. Um, it was a, a really productive week, which is nice, uh, because next week it's going to rain. and So stick around for that. We'll be working in the greenhouse and, and doing some other projects that we can do inside. And really, this is important. Please do share us. Please reach out. Um, send this video out to uh, friends, family, anybody. Share it on your social media, anything like that. It's, it's really uh, helpful for us to get the word out about this. Um, and uh, to talk to more people, reach more people about the, the project we've been uh, carrying out. So feel free to reach out, send me an email, scott at lowtechinstitute.org, or uh, just leave a comment below in the video and I'll try and respond. And maybe if you have a question or something like that, I can respond to it in the video. I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, don't forget to check out our blog, lowtechinstitute.org. Uh, subscribe, all those things. You know the drill by now. Uh, please do that and uh, stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves.